Welcome to the Therapeutic Food Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Marion Mitchell. I'm an integrative nutrition health coach, therapeutic diet expert, and founder of The Road to Living Whole. There are many different diets out there. It's hard to know which one is right for you with your chronic illness and autoimmune disease. In this podcast, I'm going to share with you the foundational pieces every single therapeutic diet out there shares, and also how to use the best one for your particular diagnosis. If you've been looking for a meal planning partner, help navigating the complicated healthcare system, and want to feel better quickly, I'm your girl. Grab your kombucha and notebook. Let's dive in. Welcome back, everybody. Today, I have a very special guest. His name is Evan Transu, and we're going to be talking about mental health and nutrition. It's not a topic that gets a whole lot of nutrition. Not a lot of people understand how connected they are. Us in the chronic illness world typically do, but he's going to give us like a really in-depth take on it, and I'm really, really excited about this. So, Evan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm excited to connect all of those together because uh, chronic illness is a huge part of my story as well. And I, I think for many people, these go hand in hand. So this will be interesting. Awesome. I'm so excited. Well, let's just dive into your story because, you know, most of us in the chronic, when we come to the point where we're teaching others, we've gone through it ourselves. <laughs> and it's almost, an, it's really inspiring to hear people who've like made it to the other side, or maybe you're still going through it just at a lesser <laughs> intensity. Um, so yeah, share your story. Tell us like how you got started and where you're at now and what you do. Sure. So, um, and thank you. I just want the audience to know she gave me permission beforehand that I can kind of run with this <laughs> if need be. So I promise I'm not this, uh, this extroverted, but it all started at five years old and it, it was very young for me. I started exhibiting my first health symptoms and what those looked like at the time uh, that I remember were bad, bad stomach aches, migraines. So different than headaches, right? It was migraines with the light sensitivity and all that, uh, but also panic attacks uh, for the mental health side. Now, what was interesting at that time, if I mean, interesting, you can define that in many ways, but interesting looking back is none of this was every day. In fact, I wouldn't even say I was affected by these things more than like three days out of the month, maybe. And so, especially when you're five, you know, you're like happy little kid running around all the time. At least I was blessed to be. I had two good parents and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, I kind of would have these symptoms. Now, you know, they last for 20, 30 minutes, whatever it is. Migraines would last longer for sure. But then I kind of moved on with the rest of my day and I'm back to being just happy kid, not really thinking about much. Well, we did go to a doctor for the panic attack specifically. Now, mind you, I'm 28 now, so we're going back 23 years. Anyone listening to this is going to be old enough to realize we have made incredible strides in terms of mental health stigma in the last five years, let alone 23 or 25 years. So the stigma, people don't realize this, the stigma also affects healthcare professionals just as much as it affects the lay person. And I'm using the word panic attack now. We didn't know that back then. What we knew is Evan has these episodes, my parents would say that, where obviously something's wrong with him. We don't know what's wrong with him, but we love him. We want that to stop. So we went to the doctor, and at the time, the person did not diagnose this as panic attacks. They actually said, this isn't something to worry about. Evan gets himself a little too worked up, and he is going to outgrow this. I also would like to say, I'm not saying this uh, person was a bad doctor. Again, the stigma affects them just like it does the rest of us. I don't think there was an expectation 23 years ago of a young kid who was otherwise happy and doing well in school and stuff, kindergarten, coming in with two parents and having panic attacks. It just didn't add up. It wasn't the formula. Well, unfortunately, it was panic attacks. And the reason that we know that is because over the next 10 years, the symptoms, both physical health wise and mental health wise, started to get worse and worse and stack on. By the time I was 15 years old, all those things that were maybe three days out of a month uh, were now daily symptoms. I had severe cystic acne, and I know a lot of teenagers deal with that stuff. I don't believe for one second that that's normal, but people might think that that's normal enough. Uh, regular headaches, uh, severe stomach pain that would sometimes land me in the hospital. Thankfully, nothing ever that they did something about, but um, it was scary enough that we had to go to the doctor to check, like, is this appendicitis? Is this something else? And the mental health symptoms, especially, that was uh, those were the... Uh, they took the cake is what I'm trying to say. Uh, panic attacks were daily without exaggeration. Generalized anxiety disorder was now present and major depressive disorder was now present. I still wouldn't get formally diagnosed for another few years, but I was very aware that I was different than other people. And I was very aware that there was something wrong with me. But the label that I used was crazy 
And the reason I said that is one, again, the difference in mental health stigma. Now we're going 13 years back versus now still very different. But also, I never forgot what that doctor said. I mean, you don't remember much from five years old, right? But I did remember this idea that you are fine, you're going to outgrow this. So the worse I got, that didn't make me at seven, eight, nine years old say, oh, maybe the doctor didn't get it right and we should go see another one. What it made me think is, oh, doctor, super smart, doctor, super educated. I must be the problem. And so if the super smart doctor can't figure it out and I'm the problem, maybe I shouldn't talk to anyone about these things. And you know, you can get into a whole rabbit hole with that around the stigma versus males and females. There's a lot of things that, you know, both males and females um, have to their advantages and then to their disadvantages, right? This is one of those things where I think that stigma added it on too, but I wasn't talking about these things. That was for damn sure, but I had problems and they needed to get solved. And so my solution to that was despite being the last person in my friend group to ever try a drug, including weed, including alcohol, uh, being very willing to engage in that stuff once the depression kicked in. It wasn't the anxiety that did it. I didn't like that, but I was still Evan, even though I was anxious. Uh, depression wasn't me, and that's not an excuse for bad behavior or bad choices, but that was, no, that's not the same person. I don't think anyone in my life would say that. So then you start using the drugs, and it's a very stereotypical story from there. The stuff that I started with eventually doesn't work the same way that it used to. Well, I'm already in it. So now I'm stacking on drugs, uh, perhaps where it's a little different than the stereotype, although other people have been through this too. Uh, this got very expensive, very fast. And I still had this moral compass in my head to some degree trying to guide me. So I couldn't steal. I could not bring myself to do that, but I could sell. And so I start selling the drugs myself to support my own habit. And this was really crazy. Um, I didn't mention, but when I was five years old, and I'm not bragging, I was not good at sports. I was not the best looking kid. That's for damn sure. I was really good at school, though. That was my thing. I was like recommended for the school district's gifted program. I had all these things going for me. And yet you fast forward 10 years, I'm selling drugs, I'm failing classes. It's it is bad. And I maintained that for another couple of years until the beginning of my senior year in high school. I had very uh, strained relationships in my life, including with my parents. Uh, they are very good people. These situations are super complicated when you're dealing with them at one's house. They didn't know a damn thing about mental health. They didn't know how to handle these things. Um, I threatened if they did stuff, not to them, but I threatened to hurt myself. And so they parents don't know how to deal with that if they're not trained in this stuff. It was It was a very confusing time for all of us. But what started to happen when things really made a change, first negative, but then super positive, was 17 days into my senior year of high school, or perhaps you could say even a few days before that. Uh, one thing I'm never proud to admit is the the odd thoughts that you start getting when you abuse drugs. Uh, you get very paranoid. I'm sure maybe not everyone's the same, but I was getting very paranoid. Uh, not to the point of like being delusional. I'm not talking about something where I, I think the government's watching me, but I mean, I guess in a sense, maybe, maybe I did when you hear what I'm about. When you hear what I'm about to say, it's a minor version of that. I had it in my head that when I turned 18, I'm a September birthday, so I'm always very early in the school year. I had it in my head that when I turned 18, someone was waiting for me to arrest me to try me as an adult. So actually, it's kind of ironic that that would be the government watching you, right? And to a degree, local government. And so I had it in my head. They're waiting for me. They're going to catch me selling. They're going to try me as an adult. They want a bigger charge. I had no evidence of this. It was just in my head that this is what was going to happen. So the irony is that led to positive action. I said, I'm going to quit the drugs. I'm going to make it out scot-free. We've had some fun, air quotes, over the last two years. Uh, you know, because there's highs with it, but it's more lows than anything. But I looked at it as like, oh, this reckless teenage fun. I got away with this for two years. And then, you know, I was smart and I stopped before I got caught because most people don't do that. So I throw away all the drugs, stop everything. And I made it 36 hours <laughs> because now I'm trying to deal with the drug withdrawal, but also deal with these problems that have been not only accumulating to a degree over the last two years, but getting worse because I've been hiding them for two years. I, I lost my stuff. Um, I got into a a, a serious a physical altercation with someone else at my school who did not want to engage in a physical altercation. Uh, that's the nice way to say it. And um, I was arrested. I, I didn't even know I could get arrested for something like that. I didn't think 10 minutes or I didn't think 10 years ahead. I thought 10 minutes ahead at the time. Uh, I never thought about consequences like that. But I was arrested that day. I got put into juvie. And I spent my 18th birthday actually on house arrest uh, because of those choices. And within a 30 second decision, it was like, 
bam, life turned completely upside down. Almost at the end here, I promise. So I get onto probation after being on house arrest, and I continued to do the same stuff I did before. I continued to abuse drugs. It was the only coping mechanism I had ever taught myself was drugs. Now, no one really understood the degree of my drug problem. Remember, I got in trouble for a fight, not for drugs. So I didn't say why I was acting like that that day. I said, oh, yeah, I was just pissed off, and everyone thought it was just teenage hormones, whatever. So I'm still abusing drugs on house arrest. I have people dropping this off to the end of my parents' driveway at three in the morning uh, because I'm that desperate for this stuff. I get away with that long enough to get off house arrest and put on probation. You're not going to get away with that forever, though. What was weird about this situation is I was only a juvenile for 13 days uh, before being put on probation uh, or sorry, before um I guess I guess I got arrested 13 days before turning 18 is the right way to say it. So because of that, I'm actually spending most of my time on probation as an adult, but I'm on juvenile probation. So thankfully, that's a slap on the wrist, comparatively speaking. Now, the reason that's significant is because these probation officers are not stupid. They know that the first thing that you're going to do when you get off probation is go back into a world filled with young, uh, filled with young adults that are going to college, that are drinking every weekend and partying. So they're not negligent themselves, but they actually want to expose you to these things to hopefully see if you can manage this stuff and manage yourself uh, when you're going to be exposed to that the second that you get off. So everyone in my life, well, adults at least, thought I was doing well. So what we came up with is that I was allowed out on New Year's Eve of that year. So it's about three and a half months after I initially got arrested. Now, this isn't go drink and do stupid crap. Don't get me wrong. But this is, hey, let's see what happens when you see your friends. Uh, you are going to get dropped off by your parents tonight and you're going to get picked up by them right at 12 a.m. So don't get any ideas in your head. But we need to see what you can do um, when you are around these types of people. So I get dropped off. Uh, I made it 10 minutes and I was drinking and doing drugs. We get picked up by my parents at 12 a.m. right on the dot, just like they said they would. Now, who's we? I haven't said we yet. So we is my uh, me and my girlfriend, and we have been dating for about four or five years already at the time. Now, I love this girl. think I'm going to marry her one day. I just don't always really treat her like that when I'm using these drugs. And unfortunately for her, we know how often I was doing that. I convinced her to do a lot of the same things I did that night. Well, this girl's about 105 pounds, five feet tall, soaking wet. Uh, well, five feet tall, 105 pounds, soaking wet. She's still five feet tall, whether she's soaking wet or not, right? It's still the same height. But um, she did those things, and uh, she didn't handle it so well. We get into the car with my parents, and she's okay. She's safe. I don't mean something like that. But it was very obvious uh, that she was not her normally incredibly shy and timid self. Uh, she had a story to share with my parents. She's saying how much she loves me, all this stuff. I'm like, oh my God. I mean, it was like someone took her personality and just jacked the dial up all the way to full extrovert mode. It was a night and day difference for how she normally was. It was so obvious that something was wrong. My parents lost it, man. We have been driving for all of 30 seconds down the highway. They slam on the brakes and they turn around, stop the car fully. They turn around and they start screaming at the top of their lungs at my girlfriend. And at first, I, I grew up with a sibling. So at first, I was used to getting in trouble with someone else. I thought it was going to be like her first, me next. I thought that's how this was going to go. Uh, they never yelled at me at all that night. And at some point while they were yelling at her, I began to realize this was not like the other fights. Or Sorry, this was not like um, these other arguments or anything like that. What was happening is they thought it was actually just her. And I think a part of them, just so they don't sound like stupid people, because again, they're not, they're great parents, smart people. I think they didn't want to believe this, man. I don't think they could comprehend that the son that they raised very well could be so stupid as to get into their car drunk and high on New Year's Eve of all nights on probation. It was just beyond their comprehension that these are the things that I were uh, was engaging with on a daily basis. So they're freaking out at her. Um, you know, she's super upset. And then we end up finishing the ride home uh, in dead silence. It was very awkward, a awkward, angry parent silence, I always call it. And we get home. I have one of two choices. The first choice is the correct one. It is to admit to my girlfriend all the things that I was thinking in the car, because in those moments of silence, I was actually starting to think something good and productive. I was starting to realize that this person has had my back through some of the worst times of my life, and I've never thanked them. 
I was starting to realize that this person did not deserve um, to be in the situation that they're in that night. Like, who the hell am I to convince them to do these drugs and stupid crap like this? And this is the worst one, especially talking to a woman. Uh, we had been dating again for four or five years at the time. I was so emotionally closed off. I've never actually said I love you to this person, despite loving them probably two months into the relationship. At best, it was like an ILY, right? Illy or whatever you, you would say as an acronym when you're a kid. Um, that was it. And so I thought, maybe you should say that too, because that's the truth. Well, that was the first option. Remember, there's two choices here. The second choice is to kind of go back into my um, my old habits and the things I was really good at. And I don't have a college degree, but I actually had a PhD, believe it or not, at the age of 18. And the PhD was in blaming other people for my problems. So it wasn't a real PhD, uh, but I was really good at this. And so I chose to yell at my girlfriend for getting caught for the things I made her do. And in that drunk, high yelling, uh, there were some things said that you probably shouldn't say to anyone, let alone someone that you love. And thank God, uh, apparently, even at my worst, I'm not c capable of something physical abusively, but you can still hurt someone with words, man. I think we all know that. I don't need to remind anyone of that. Well, the last memory I have of this person, basically, is her crying for about an hour straight before we went to bed. I wake up in the morning and I notice she was already gone. That wasn't like her at all. And so I'm sober and I'm starting to think clear. And I'm realizing, dude, what are you doing? Like, that is not a good plan last night. And I'm realizing the weight of what that must have felt like for her because she would have never left no matter how bad I pissed her off. And so sober now, I'm thinking, okay, you got to go tell her all that stuff from last night. So I'm going to call her. And when she answers, but she always answers me, do not let her talk. Go through all of this. Thank her. Tell her you're sorry. Tell her that you love her. And then we can work from there. It's probably not going to be fun, but at least we can work with those things. Well, I give her a ring. Rings a bunch of times, goes to voicemail. Do the same thing about 10 minutes later, rings a bunch of times, goes to voicemail. Now, this was like the girl that had your back enough that I could have called her at 3 a.m. on a school night and she still would have answered. And I feel so bad for the ladies out there because many of them have dated a stupid guy that they would have done this for. And the guy's still the idiot and uh, doesn't realize how valuable that is and how amazing that is. So after about the 10th call, I got the picture that this, is, this isn't going to happen. And what I realized is, this really is different this time. This is not the same as it once was. What this person was telling me is, dude, I'm not stupid. You don't think I know that you're messed up and dealing with stuff? I've been with your partner for the last four or five years. I am very aware of this. I'm hoping that you'll do the right thing and get help because you can't be told anything by anyone. I don't listen to a damn thing anyone says. The problem that night was now you're hurting me. It's one thing if you're taking it out on yourself, we can work on that together and hopefully figure this out. I, I can't handle this. And I'm, I'm glad that she had that self-respect and those boundaries uh, because it saved my life. That hurt so bad losing this person. I don't know if it was just the final piece of the puzzle stacked onto the arrests and all this other stuff, or hey, teenage love's pretty powerful, right? That can, do, that can do a lot for people. That was the mover, man. I instantly got my self-awareness back because remember I said earlier, I felt like I was always like thinking 10 minutes ahead, not 10 years ahead. Um, half of that's just a result of teenagehood. Um, another half of that was the drug abuse, but it came back like floodgates just opened. All of a sudden I'm seeing 10 years ahead, which is right now I'm 28, right? This is not that long ago in the grand scheme of things. And I hated what I saw. I'm realizing I'm using hard drugs on probation. I am going to go to jail or I'm going to die. <laughs> Those were not the options that I went and chose, but that's the path that I was living. And I started to connect the consequences, the potential consequences that is with my actions. I did not connect that ever. I was just living for the moment, just living to feel better. And all of those actions that I took on a daily basis were for feeling better. Blaming other people made me feel better, right? So then I didn't have to accept personal responsibility and the drugs hid the symptoms. So that girl saved my life because it got me back on track. Um, and I'm not saying things were perfect after that. It's not how this works. This journey for most people is very much a case of two steps forward, one step back. And when you're doing that, that sucks sometimes. And it's discouraging and it hurts. But if you do that long enough, man, even one step back, you're still in a way better place than you were when you started, right? You just got to do it over time. And so thankfully, over these last 10 years, 
uh, things have worked out great. I ended up getting into holistic health and functional medicine, which is why I'm on a podcast like this, just so this isn't totally uh, disconnected for people and they think it's random. It's actually the next thing I discovered was the holistic health side of things. Um, I not only got all my conditions resolved. So at 18, I had seven different diagnosed conditions. I do not meet the criteria diagnostically for any of those conditions anymore, which is amazing. Uh, but I ended up turning my stuff around. I got into professional speaking. I've been blessed enough to give over 500 uh, professional presentations to youth and not about functional medicine per se, but just getting your stuff together, right, man, asking for help, letting them know that it's, uh, I know it's so cliche now, I was doing this before the pandemic, but it's okay to not be okay, right? That doesn't mean you're broken, doesn't mean that you're unlovable, doesn't mean anything like that. It just means that you need some help and support, uh, just like we would need support for our physical health, right? So, uh, things have worked out really well. Um, I, I do own a business. I think you mentioned that in the beginning where we do functional medicine stuff. So uh, there's a lot to unpack here, but that that moment was, it was pivotal for me. It was like, I can see life before that and I can see life after that. And I always call it my aha moment. And anytime I speak, whether I'm lucky enough to get to speak in a school or lucky enough to be on someone's podcast, I always say, man, if you're waiting for the aha moment for you, which might mean a conversation with someone else, it might mean a conversation about yourself. I don't know what that means for the listener, but they know what it means for them. If you're looking for the sign, maybe we make today the aha moment for you. Don't wait for another kick in the ass because sometimes those kicks, um, they end up a lot worse uh, than what happened to me. You can recover after losing someone in the relationship and you know, you're know you both still alive and well, thank God, right? Not every story ends like that. That's not how every person gets their kick in the butt if they're lucky enough to get one at all. So maybe take advantage of that uh, while you still can. And uh, thank you for letting me share that part of the story. I'll pause there. Yeah, it's such a powerful story. I have a teenager right now and it is, oh, it's rough. Like it's not anything I ever expected teenagers to look like. And it's so wonderful that you were able to turn it around, but not on, like it's the like, it's like, People are so against pharmaceuticals, right? That they will self-medicate. Yep. And then the self-medicate can become something quite dangerous and life ruining. And it's very common. It's not an uncommon thing to happen. Um, you know, I think I told you a little bit before and I'll tell the audience now, like in my family, both sides, on one side, I have a history, uh, like a schizophrenia. And on the other side is bipolar because of my my journey into health and functional nutrition and all of that, I understand that diet plays a huge role along with nutrition deficiencies and things like that. And sometimes, you know, you either self-medicate with illegal drugs or you medicate with pharmaceuticals. And sometimes you have to be on them for life and it's okay. You know, um, so many people are like, oh, I don't want to be dependent on anything, da, 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 you know, but a lot of times there are reversible and sometimes we do need that support and removing the stigma like you talked about is so huge. Um, but I also think people truly underestimate the power of nutrition and functional medicine. So I would love for you to dive into that and the science that you know is behind it. Yeah. And I appreciate your objective uh, approach there because just for the record, I I 100% agree with that. And it's not something that you can say to everyone in the functional medicine space. They don't agree with that, especially with the mental health thing. And um, I know it comes from a place of genuine ignorance, so I'm not uh, mad about it in any way. But, you know, I, I want to see a middle ground. I would love to see someone like me at that age. Yeah, man, probably medicated, dude. I was off my rocker. It was bad. But then also asking, how did a kid without a history of trauma get to this point? Because if you look at my life now, no, I don't need any of that stuff, right? Just by taking care of my lifestyle, I was able to get these things resolved. I, Like I said, do not meet the diagnostic criteria for these things anymore, which is amazing. So what I'm saying is put on the damn life jacket and then we can pull your ass out of the water, right? <laughs> like Exactly <but> <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> And it's like, whether it's mental health or physical health, sometimes you need that extra support yeah. just so that you can function, think clearly to be able to do the things you need and, and have the energy to be able to do the things you need to do in the holistic realm to support that. Right. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean it in a cheesy way, right? It's pretty hard to think about getting to the bank of the river when you can't even stay above the water. Like you're just trying to float, right? So if I can get you floating, then it's like, okay, well, I'm good. I mean, I'd rather not be here, but I'm good. Okay, how do I get over there? Right? How can I put in the work to start getting to the side here and then get myself out? I mean, that takes time and that's okay. So not a perfect analogy, but I think you guys know what I mean. 
And so the next step, I mean, this was all, uh, it was just beyond divine intervention. And people don't have to believe that that's fine. But there was so many stupid little things that had to happen for me to get to these next steps. It was uh, unbelievable and incredible looking back. I ended up unintentionally uh, getting involved in this like nutrition company. And it was like a network marketing type of thing. I'm not in it anymore. But I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because on probation, you know, they want to see you doing something productive. And so they had me get my GED uh, because I got kicked out of school. I got expelled. And so they had me get my GED and then they had me go to a community college uh, early. And so I was at this community college. I was shy as could be, believe it or not, that actually is true. And um, <laughs> I didn't talk to people back then. And one person out of the whole time I was there for like a semester and a half actually voluntarily talked to me. And his name was Eli. And Eli was basically trying to recruit me for the network marketing thing. And I thank God that he did because he recruited me into that. I go to a meeting with these kids after like three invites. I never said yes until the third invite. And I go there and I see that they're into personal development. That's what they were talking about. So I got sold on that. It just so happened that the company's product happened to be a health and wellness product. So I start drinking this like high dose multivitamin healthy energy drink thing, they called it. And I noticed that my mental health got better slowly. Of course, what I first thought, I didn't even attribute it to the drink. I said, well, duh, of course I feel better. I'm around the right people. I have goals for the first time in my life. I was, gosh forbid, reading books on like how to better yourself and reading inspirational stories. So that made sense to me. Of course, I feel better mentally. But then the company, like unfortunately, not all, but many network marketing companies, um, the company got in trouble. And they did win the case, but it completely destroyed the company in the meantime. And so we weren't selling the products anymore, but I kept all the friends. I went to a, two of the couple's weddings just this past year. So I've known them forever and they're still very close to me, but the mental health thing came back. So I'm still into personal development. I still have the friends, but now the mental health symptoms are slowly coming back. And I'm like, what? And I started to connect. The only variable that changed was that I stopped taking the high uh, dose multivitamin. Now, if you're dealing with severe mental health issues or physical health issues, I'm not saying a multivitamin alone is going to get you there, but it made a dent for me. And I am sure I did not use such a complex word at the time, but whatever I said, it was something along the lines of, I wonder if nutraceuticals can affect mental health. And you go and search this and you can find tons of studies on how- Thousands, yeah, thousands. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? How did no one tell me this? Like this, I didn't, I didn't fully understand science then. And maybe I don't now, but I mean, I know how to read a damn study at this point. And so I'm looking at this stuff. I'm like, why was I never told about this or taught this? And so everything changed after that. I, I had hope. I had the needle moving in the right direction. It was something I wanted to do. And so I just started doing these experiments. I ate organic first and like literally didn't change anything else. I just ate organic and tried to eat less sugar. I didn't even care if I ate like you know, candy type stuff. It was just had to be organic. That was my thing back then. Um, and it kind of worked. I mean, my skin was, was very severe with the acne at the time and it got like 70% better uh, in 30 days. It was ridiculous. It worked better than any antibiotic they had given me, any cleanser. It was awesome. And so now I'm seeing this physical health stuff get better too. Remember, I'm so gone mentally that that's the only thing I'm focused on. The as funny as it sounds, the severe cystic acne, the terrible stomach pains, the migraines, they're just a sideshow at this point. But I'm watching all of this stuff get better simultaneously. It was amazing to me. And then I pursued, um, through my mom's recommendation, actually, uh, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, uh, which was- That's where great. I went. Awesome. Yeah. Great program, yeah. especially mm -hmm. for the coaching side, right? Yes. Um, FDN, where I work now, we don't really teach the coaching side. Uh, we, we have our own strengths, but it's- it's helpful uh, to be able to coach someone when they have been through some of the worst things in their life. That's very useful. So I learned that I took some of their tips and I got a little better. Uh, I was still moving in the right direction, uh, but technically speaking, I did meet the criteria for most, if not all of the diagnoses that I had, maybe other than one. And so I'm like, all right, what's next? I end up finding FDN, Functional Diagnostic Nutrition, which was a, a great complimentary program. One's not good. One's not bad. To me, they're just compliments. And that was all about the labs, all about the the deep science and all these things. I needed objective data, man. I needed to I needed to know what the hell was wrong with my body. And so I went through that program and did the stuff that they do. And that's when I got to a hundred percent. So there was work that happened before uh hand. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So and I'm on the test, don't guess. I think mm -hmm. the more information, the better. It's just in my experience of 11 years of coaching that those who test the needle moves much faster for them. 
would you be willing to go into some of the stuff that you, some of the tests that you took and some of the results that you found at that time? Absolutely. And so it's not going to be easy to remember, but an acronym that might help, um, we call them hidden stressors. So we test for hidden stressors, which is hormonal, immune, digestion, detoxification, energy production, and nervous system. So we're actually using five tests uh, to look at those six things. And you can also throw in oxidative stress in there if you want. So the first thing was the hormone test. And what we do is a salivary hormone test where we look at four different samples throughout the day. And there's a bunch of cool stuff that you can do on this. But my favorite part about it is actually getting to analyze um, clients' patterns throughout the day. So we can see where their cortisol went. And for those uh, unaware of this, you don't you don't need to know anything. This will still make sense. Cortisol, a normal trend for it should be relatively high in the morning. I'm not saying high above reference range, but relatively high to the rest of the day. And it should almost slope down, like kind of like slopes down and then, uh, you know, goes very low at night. Melatonin should go high. Now you can rest. Same thing in the morning. So it's kind of like the sloping up and down. Well, mine was indeed high in the morning. It was actually within range. But then the problem after that, whoop, it tanked. I mean, it tanked all the rest of the day. All three markers are at sorry, the remaining three markers outside of morning uh, were all well below reference range. And so what that indicates is, you know, my body's been stressed. It doesn't have that same um, same level of vital reserve, we call it, to really fight life stressors. And I mean, I could have told you that. I could have felt that. But it was interesting to see it on the labs and see what else was going on. So it, it wasn't was really... just a mental thing. You saw the physiological. Exactly. Thing. It was the most so... validating thing. Um, yeah. I mean, my progesterone, which is primarily associated as like more of a female uh, hormone was four and a half times the highest end of the reference range for males. So the highest went to hundred, I was 450. And like my mentor couldn't even explain that one. And which is actually a key point of the FDN philosophy, but he couldn't tell me why that was happening. We just knew, Hey, that's freaking bad. And then, um, I mean, I looked at food sensitivities. This was one of the biggest ones, my friend. Uh, we found out for both myself and my mom, who's dealt with her own stuff. Uh, we had a non-celiac, non-allergy gluten sensitivity. So we could measure it on a test, but it was not an allergy and it was not celiac. That mm. man was probably one of the best changes I've ever made. We had gut tests that we did, right? So we're looking at the digestion and detoxification. I mean, I had a parasite. I had H. pylori. I, I have so much dysbiosis, of course, because I had been on like 20 antibiotics before the age of 18. I mean, my guts trashed. All this stuff looked so obvious when you did this type of testing. But when I went to my family practitioner at 18 and did blood work, everything looked normal. He's like, you have slightly high cholesterol. That was what they said to me. But on these tests, it was so clear that a lot of stuff was wrong. So, you know, I'm oversimplifying it for the sake of today, but we walk through these protocols and we help people through this system. And like I said, something um, that's kind of key with the progesterone thing, I said, it almost doesn't matter that we didn't know why it was super high. It's because we don't treat anything specifically. We treat everything non-specifically. So what that means is the tests are useful in figuring out what's going wrong and figuring out how we can uh, apply what we call intelligent allopathy. So allopathy is usually the treatment of symptoms through drugs and surgery. Intelligent allopathy is like, okay, is there a supplement or a holistic therapy that we can do to help this in the meantime while we address the root causes of what's going on? So still to this day, I couldn't tell you why the progesterone was high. I could just tell you by doing the right things, my progesterone went to normal range by the next test. Um, so we addressed all that stuff, which is like the best of Western medicine. You're looking at tests. It is very complicated. It is very science-based, but we're actually relying on Eastern medicine. We're relying on this innate healing ability that the body has. And it is so funny to me. I know you wouldn't think this, but so many people think that's like, okay, now we're getting into the woo-woo and all that stuff. There's well, nothing. I don't think that, but right. you know, you have to think about the people who are very new to leaving allopath allopathy and coming into the holistic realm. And this does sound really woo woo, you know, and then some of the things that I think of is you hear, especially I, I follow a lot of social media accounts, mainstream doctors, plus naturopathic and functional and everything in between, mostly because I just want to see what the trends are. What are people talking about? What are they arguing about? Because I want to, as a health coach, I want to be able to I want to, I want to hear all sides and do my own research. I want to hear why do they feel that way? Why do they, why do they argue that are there are both sides supported? And like, and then of course I come to my own conclusions. I try to use my own brain. Right. Mm -hmm. So the thought of like, Oh, dysbiosis, like mainstream medical community doesn't address that. 
-hmm. They think that that's completely woo woo. Right. And they're saying, oh, your progesterone high. Why would you even test for that? That doesn't tell you any, um, what I love. And this is where I think as a health coach, this is where I am at. I call it middle of the road, which doesn't get a lot of attention because it's all about balance. right? But like everybody wants to tackle the problem when really you just have to get the things out of the way that are causing the body to not function optimally and give it the proper fuel to be able to function optimally. And it balances itself out. You know, sometimes we, we do need the extra support. We're going to need maybe a parasite cleanse or maybe mm-hmm. an, uh, a pharmaceutical antiparasitic. You know, we might need to do some heavy metal detoxification extra beyond just getting the body functioning, you know, things like that. Um, but most people just like to kind of what I call punch, punch the diagnosis in the face and just kind of like really go after that, but neglect just overall health. So I love that you, that you are, you guys have that approach. I think that's. I, I, I think that's the best way to go personally. Yeah. Well, and I mean, thankfully, everything that we're doing in the FDN system, I mean, perhaps the uh, it was a good point about the dysbiosis because that's probably way underrepresented in um, Western medicine. But everything else, it's it's acknowledged like, no, they don't agree at all that you should have a uh, blastocystis hominis, which is the parasite that I had. It's how we address it and why it became a thing in you to begin with. That's the that's the difference. Right. But the innate healing ability thing is always such a funny one because it's like some people won't believe that we have that. And I'm like, okay, I can prove it to you in literally two sentences. And they're like, okay, how do you do that? I asked two questions. Have you ever had a paper cut or have you or anyone that you've known ever had a broken bone that healed? So the paper cut thing, everyone's had that. You have to be alive for like two weeks before you get that. And so (laughs) that cut healed itself. You did not need to tell it what to do. You didn't go to a doctor. You really don't even have to change your damn diet for that one because it's such a little stress on the body. So think about how amazing that is that the body registers, oh, hey, our host here screwed up. So we're going to adjust this for the host and make it better. It's an incredible thing. But the bone thing too, that might be more substantial to people. Um, Just so you guys know, when a cast goes on, there's not some magical uh, chemical that gets released from the cast that rebuilds the bone. They're just putting it in place so it regrows properly. What's happening is as you're casted, the body is reconnecting everything and making sure everything's good to go. So that's an innate healing ability if you ask me. What needs to be done, though, and considered, and the proof of this is the different uh, times and rates that people heal, right? Because if you have an 80-year-old type 2 diabetic that's had it for 40 years and they get a paper cut, their paper cut might take actually a couple weeks uh, to heal properly versus, you know, a five-year-old that's super healthy might be gone in a couple of days. So that innate healing ability, even for something as simple as a paper cut, can obviously be greatly stressed depending on what we're doing to our bodies. So fundamentally, what the FDN system is, is removing some of the biggest stressors that could happen on the body, addressing the lifestyle stuff to make sure that these labs never get bad again. Because if really, if you did all the lifestyle stuff perfect from day one of being born, you probably wouldn't ever need our labs, but that's not how we live today. That's not reality, right? Just even what we're doing right now is wonderful as it is. Um, we're still exposed to EMFs. We're still exposed to artificial blue light. We're still inside, not grounded. It's not a good idea. Uh, in in many senses. And so when we remove enough of those stressors, I always compare it to like a seesaw, you're basically weighing out the innate healing ability and the stress on the body. And if you lower the stress enough, boom, all of a sudden this wins and it goes higher, or I guess you could say lower, depending on what analogy you want to use with the seesaw, regardless, as one side goes lower, one side goes higher. And so what we want is... um that innate healing ability to be in your favorable position, whether you consider that up or down, I don't know, but it needs to be in the winning position. And then given enough time, uh, you can figure out mostly anything. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. I, I love that about the body and I, I love that approach so much because that's really what it's all about. And this is what I tell people all the time. Like even with diet changes, I'm like, all we're doing is lowering because, okay, for like mold, for example, like a lot of times mold exposure isn't mold in your food, right? Like that's a completely different type of mold. But what happens is, is any type of mold is stressful when you have these other mycotoxins in your body, right? And so we go on a low mold diet and the way I design it is to be super high in all the nutrients, your body, your liver, especially, and your gut need to be able to function optimally. So when I, in my meal plan, I'm like, yeah, we're just lowering this type of mold from coming in because it's dealing with all this other stuff. This type of mold is really not that dangerous, but when you, when, when you're just, you're adding more fuel to the fire, when the fire is out of control, 
-hmm. right? But we also have to remove the oxygen from the fire, right? We have to remove, we have to basically starve it out so that the body can process it out and get it out and all of that right. stuff. So that's basically what you guys do with your testing and with your coaching and with what you do with your clients. And I, I absolutely love it. I'm a big fan of testing. I don't do that. I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, but I like to come in and be like, I can make your life easier. And yep. I do. That's what, that's what I pride myself in is making the, the transition through this hard time, through this healing journey as easy as possible while also giving that support. Like, Hey, you're doing great. You're going to have two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes you're going to take five steps forward and then take two steps back, but you're still going to be in a better place. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I love, I love testing. You know, and a lot of times people get frustrated when their tests don't show anything, but if you're doing all of those, right. And you're getting really, it's like, okay, we can see that something is out of balance. We don't know why, but we know we can help your body find balance again. And then help you, I find the biggest challenge is helping people see that their body can do it. Hmm. Yep. You know, especially people who've been really sick for a long time. You know, I get people who finally get a name for their symptoms, a diagnosis in their fifties, right. But they've been sick since 13 years, mm -hmm. you know, and like, it's almost become part of who they are. And like saying like, you're going to be a different person. is really scary. Oh, oh my God. It's for so them. Good. Yeah. You know, I always say that this health journey thing for almost everyone that will go through it. Uh, it's actually a personal development journey that's disguised with foods and supplements and whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, you you it is impossible for you to be the same person on the other side of a chronic illness. You will not, and I don't this is encouraging, not discouraging. You will not beat this unless you change as a person. It is never that simple because there are going to be habits that need to be broken, relationships that probably need to change, uh, boundaries that need to be set. So you and not to mention, you're going to have to give up the cheap highs uh, for the real fulfillment. And so like sugar, you know, excessive sugar, basic example uh, is a cheap high. You give that up, you're going to feel like crap at first. But when you have that level steady mood, well, then it was all worth it. Right. So there's things like that. I also love what you said about, you know, almost like balancing the stress with that mold example, because that's fundamentally what this is. What we all need to remember is human beings are actually quite capable and quite resilient. Otherwise, we would have never gotten um, to where we're at. I went to, uh, I left the country for the first time this summer. I went to Italy and Italy was fascinating to me because I'd always heard that they had a relatively long life expectancy. And so at the time of recording this, if you go look this up right now, uh, depending on where you look, you could find anywhere between like, they have the third uh, longest life expectancy or the sixth. Regardless, you're talking within top 10 countries out of like almost 200 or around 200. That's insane. But let's look at these people and see what they're doing. The funniest thing that I noticed while I was there that made me think, what the hell do they really have the longest life expectancy or one of them? I saw uh, ashtrays everywhere. Everywhere. And, <laughs> yes. And I go online. I'm like, what is the percentage of people that smoke that you would need to put an ashtray out on the on the table? 25% of the Italian population smokes. And it's interesting because it's not just like the stereotypes, like my grandfather and grandmother, uh, thankfully they stopped, but they did smoke. And so you kind of picture, oh, okay, well that 25% the older generation, whatever. I will never forget my fiance and I were sitting at breakfast with our two friends and at uh, the summer and we're looking across and there was like th the last person that you would expect to smoke just by stereotype. It was a beautiful, probably 25 year old girl, our age, like gorgeous, gorgeous as could be the last person that you would expect to smoke because in the U S it would be a stereotype of like, Oh, it's going to wrinkle that nice skin and all that stuff. And she's smoking at breakfast. Like it's nothing. She loves it. I'm like, I am living in like the seventies, but in Italy, like it was just crazy. And so if that doesn't show you that we are capable of handling some stress, I don't know what does because their food quality is better. They definitely have way more uh, traditional values around family and community. They're all walking all the time. It's remarkable. And the reason that they're so tan is because so many of them are outside in the sun, all those things. So I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh, there's the seesaw again, right? Like you can actually handle so much stress that some people can even get away with smoking. I'm not recommending it, but you can even get away with that. But you have to be doing all these other things right. And I just thought, how crazy is that? that 25% of this population can do these things and yet they'll still be in the top 10 for life expectancy. And you go over here in the USA and you got people like me trying to do everything right. And it's so toxic here that 
you know, we still are not actually doing that well at all, life expectancy wise for such a developed country or seemingly developed country. So it's fascinating stuff, right? It's super interesting. Yeah. And I think that it's when I think about the U.S., we think we're so far ahead Mm -hmm. when we're really I feel like we've taken a lot of steps back since probably the 40s when they started really mass like state rubber stamping pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. And, um, you know, I just saw that California banned um, bromelated vegetable oil. And now because California did it, it's going federal because you can't have one state say, oh, this ingredient can't be in any food. It has to be a national thing, right? I'm not a big fan of big government. I don't, I think it should come from the people in our pocketbooks, but if you don't know what you don't know and you just buy food that you can afford, right? Or anything like that. And it's just like, America is so toxic. And it's like, but I also think we just, we're not outside. We're not walking. We're not getting to know our neighbors. We don't have strong, you know, you know, we're not close to our families. We have all these other things stacked against us as well, just as a culture you know, these things aren't popular or cool or we're taught to be scared of people and all this stuff that, yeah, our stressors are so much higher than they are in other parts of the world, purely on that alone. And like, I live in Phoenix. This is not a walkable city, right? <laughs> like you, you can't walk anywhere. Then I, like when I lived in the South and, you know, we've traveled around that, that part of the country and up North or like Boston and stuff, you could walk the entire city in a day, sure, you know, sure. and there's no need to drive. Like, but then I think about like, oh, the grounding mats, oh, the red light saunas, oh, the, you know, all these expensive things that we do. And really health is not that complicated. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and I almost think that there's almost this problem where we are over complicating health as a nation, uh, like in the functional or in the holistic health world, we're over complicating yeah. it. And I think that's everybody's journey too. We kind of look for shortcuts. We look for the the life vests, as you called it, um, which I love that analogy. And so we're just trying to do what we can and still live our busy lives and not make any changes and not have any personal growth because we just we're just stuck in this like hamster wheel. I think too, yeah, we get um we get two categories where some people feel the need to play the game because they might literally have to, to put food on the table for their family. Um, and then others, full transparency, because I, I am someone who loves hiking. I love being outdoors. I also, I shamelessly love the game. I kind of love uh, building stuff and doing the business side or whatever. So my point in mentioning that is so many of these little health hacks, you're right. It doesn't need to be this complicated, but they're getting implemented into society because we're trying to do everything at once, right? I It's like, I want to still, you know, be able to do the sales calls or build my business or whatever it might be, or have my corporate job, but also get some health. So, all right, here's my red light therapy. Here's my supplement for this. Yeah, here's I'm not against it at all, but yeah. I just, I find what people do when, by the time they come to me is they're spending thousands of dollars right? and they, they, they just literally feel like they're on this hamster wheel. You know, when it's like, let's get back to the basics. And then what can we fit in that's going to make the most sense? No, you can't get outside because you do work a corporate job and you have all this blue light. Let's put blue light filters on your computer. Let's get you a grounding mat. You know, I I think the red light therapy while you're brushing your teeth in the morning is a great idea, (laughs) you know? And it's like, but it's like, let's find what can we remove and make easier? And then what can we add in to also make it easier, right? Yes. The hacks are incredibly useful and there's a time and place. I think we need to know ourselves, right? Like for me, I do love the game. And so mixing in the hacks with the game is fun. But at the same time, if you're someone who does not want to participate uh, in this modern world or feels like it doesn't work for you, uh, you're right. And that's totally valid. You know, we weren't meant to go uh, do the stuff that we're doing and not everyone has this luxury by any means, but so many people are working inside today that, uh, or from home, I should say that sometimes they can do this. You know, if I was a sick as I once was, and I knew everything that I knew now, let's say I could import that uh, information, I would move, man. I, w- I would go live as close to the equator as possible. I would live somewhere where there's not a lot of EMFs. I would live somewhere that I can get outside, you know, nine days out of 10 and get a strong light, vitamin D on me, all those things. I could get food locally. That's what I would do. So, you know, the biohacky stuff, which I'm very much into is kind of just how to participate in today's world while still surviving. But if you're at your sickest and you have the luxury of being able to shift around, go shift around, get that health back and then manage it um, with the biohacky stuff if you choose. And some people will not participate in that at all. And uh, not only are you not wrong for that, I envy that. Um, You know, I aspire to kind of 
have my consciousness be at that level because, you know, when you're sitting by yourself at night, you realize how, how stupid a lot of this is. Like, w- what am I really chasing all of this for? It's, it's amazing to help people with businesses. That's very cool. But at the same time, there's certain things that we try to build, whether it's status or impressing other people or whatever. And those two go hand in hand, right? That it, it's meaningless. It does not mean anything. All of this is going to disappear one day. And I don't mean that in a nihilistic way. It's just objectively true. And so it's, it's balancing it. My next business thing is opening a retreat center, like with farmland and stuff. I'm like, there's the best of both worlds, business, but also natural health to the extreme. Totally. (laughs) Totally. I I love your, uh, your thoughts on biohacking. A lot of my guests are like completely against it. They're like, just get back to the basics. And I always get, it's that perfectionist mindset. I think that sets all of us up for failure. You know, and a lot of people think that they have to be perfect to get healthy. And so, again, I love that you guys have that seesaw or, you know, teeter totter. Let's remove your stressors. Let's support the body's innate ability, right, to be able to heal so that you can handle the stress. And if you love your corporate job, but you also want to get healthy, then guidance on what hacks are going to make the most, get you the most bang for your buck, really, is what it is. Because you don't have to go bankrupt to get healthy, but you do want smart testing. You want to know what you're dealing with and you want to know how to support your body in the best way possible, right. you know? Cool. So I don't know how much time we have. If you want me to give some more direct tips on the mental health yeah, stuff. Let's do, lo- let's, let's cool. do that to wrap it up. And then cool. how can people find you? Awesome. Because yeah, I know we got into more of a, a larger philosophical conversation, <laughs> which I ab- absolutely love. Um, but I want to make sure they have some tangible things to walk away with. So uh, one of the first things that I would be doing in terms of the mental health thing is you got to get the sleep right. And yes, sounds simple, but how can we actually do that? Uh, so one thing I don't mess with is the artificial light. And I really try to do this in every way possible. So what if you're listening on audio, you can't see this. And I, I don't think this does video anyway, like you said, but uh, we're hanging out together right now. But I don't have any lights on in my room other than the computer and these windows. That's just kind of how I do things. And the screen is filtered. That has been essential for me. I'm getting outside every single morning to get sunlight. I've done that for like several years now, probably like five or six. And that I was such a problem, a troublesome person when it came to sleep stuff. Even when I was eating well, doing all these things, I couldn't get the sleep down. That was the missing ingredient for me. I needed to go out and expose myself to light in the morning, uh, but then also calm myself down at night. So I'm religious, religious with wearing the glasses, with the silly red tint. I get that, but also filtering the lights because just because you're filtering um, your eyes does not mean you're filtering the rest of your body. We still have uh, very similar receptors on our skin as we do in our eyes that lead to the body being stimulated by the artificial blue light. So I started doing- Do you have any glasses that you recommend? I do like blue blocks and I also like RA optics because both of them um, actually measure each lens under a spectrometer. I, I think there's probably other places that do that, but I can't verify that. Those I know that for a fact for both those companies. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that's a great place to start. Um, but what we also need to consider because people don't understand how like, it's like, oh yeah, I need to sleep better for my mental health. It's like, no, it's everything. So teens that stay up past 12 a.m. are 42% more likely to be diagnosed with depression than those teens that go to bed before 12 a.m. And you say, well, okay, that sucks. It's depression, not the worst thing in the world. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. (laughs) Yes, it is. Because the second leading cause of death for kids 10 to 35 years old, 35 is not a kid that's seven years older than me, right? From 10 to 35, second leading cause of death in America, suicide in that age range. Now, what's the number one cause of suicide? Untreated depression. So if I told you that there was something that you could do tomorrow to decrease your uh, teenager's risk of cancer by 42%, you would go switch it immediately. Uh, you know, so we don't take these things the same seriously, uh, same way or with the same severity. We don't hold it to the same um, level of severity that we should, but we need to because this is killing more young people than cancers sometimes. So it is it is that serious. It does matter that much. Um, For adults, a really interesting study showed that light in the bedroom that's only around like 10 lux uh, was enough to dramatically increase the risk of depression. So just for people not understanding how the hell you measure lux, uh, if you had a candle that you were looking at from about a foot away, that would be about five to 10 lux. Now that's fairly obnoxious. I get that, right? So we're talking about like the candles in the room and you're trying to sleep. Uh, Certainly, if you have a street light coming in behind the curtains, which almost everyone does, uh, or if, oh, please don't do this. 
falling asleep with the TV on, looking at the phone until the last second before you go to bed, you are truly uh, risking depression. Um, You're risking the suicidal stuff that comes with depression. Uh, There's also been studies showing that exposure to artificial blue light at night, like similar to the amount of a street lamp coming in behind a curtain, raises the risk. And I can send you the studies, by the way, if you need this for the show notes. 1.5x prostate cancer risk for men, 1.5x breast cancer risk for women. The only thing that they were testing for is how much artificial blue light they were exposed to while they were sleeping. And the amount that is given to you from behind curtains, just from a street lamp, raise those cancer risks by 1.5x. And they're some of the most common uh, cancers that males or females could get respectively. Again, if I told you something like that, you would change it tomorrow, you'd think. Uh, But it's a lot harder to do these things because we can't understand how something so simple uh, could lead to such profoundly negative um, things. So that's all stuff I would be doing. Sleep in pitch black if you can. If you're like, well, then I can't wake up. I mean, I I recommend waking up to sunrise, but uh, you can use a dawn simulator. I I don't use that personally. I'd rather wake up to the sunrise, but that's a hell of a good uh, trade-off. It's better than waking up to your phone first thing. That's for damn sure. And having an alarm that scares the hell out of you and spikes that cortisol, uh, that's no good, right? So are we we still okay on time? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Uh, so that's the light side, right? You get that done and and you had to do it right, man. You got to give it some time. I always tell clients, uh, because the sunrise one, that is usually the one that they're most resistant to. They, they just don't get it, right? They're like, how can this possibly help? So I say, okay, do me a favor. What we're going to do is no matter what time you go to bed right now, I don't care if you go to bed at two in the morning, but set an alarm for sunrise. You got to go outside with bare eyes for 15 to 30 minutes. You can go right back in and start sleeping again if you want. That's fine. I have never had a client make it the full 30 days without their sleep schedule being completely readjusted. All of a sudden, without fail, I get the text two weeks in and they'll say something like, oh, dude, I just went to bed at 10 p.m. for the first time since I was a kid and I woke up at six. I'm like, isn't that amazing how that works, right? Just like an animal, we have the same kind of things in our body that keep us either diurnal or nocturnal, depending on what type of animal we are. And contrary to popular modern belief of most teenagers and young adults, we are diurnal. We're not nocturnal. So uh, we want to get exposed to that light during the day when it is actually sunlight or when there is sunlight out. So that's a huge thing. Um, The other major thing that I would list off for today, and again, this is not something I mean generically. It's like, what can we actually do for this? But it is the gut health side. We There are certain requirements to make neurotransmitters. One of them is protein. Uh, that's a main one, right? And so if you are not eating enough protein, which most people, even in the functional medicine space, are not, well, now you're already disadvantaged. But what happens to... If I'm eating enough protein per se, but I'm not digesting that protein because just because I put a hundred grams in doesn't mean that I absorbed a hundred grams. It's almost like if I had a a gas tank in a car and I thought I filled it up uh, fully, like I did 13 gallons or whatever it is for my sedan, but I really only got seven because there was a freaking hole halfway up and all the gas was getting poured out. I just didn't realize that that's what's happening. Uh, not a, again, not a perfect analogy. I have no perfect analogies if that's not clear by now. But what's happening with the leaky gut stuff and the compromised digestion is even if you are eating the right amount of protein, which again, most people aren't, we're not absorbing it. And so we have severely protein deficient human beings running around and we need that stuff to create these neurotransmitters. Um One other thing real quick, if I may, about the light, Mm -hmm. uh, because it's always just an interesting one. I promised you in the beginning, I'd say something that people probably uh, haven't heard of before. That's kind of always my goal because mental health is a very generic topic in a sense. One thing is UVA light. And this is something that never gets discussed. And I love talking about it. So UVA is the one that in extreme amounts could tan you. This is something that you would find in a tanning bed. And you might have heard, even if you've never used a tanning bed for people listening, uh, you might have heard tanning beds are addictive. And it's like, well, why is that? I wonder where that happens. So it turns out UVA, when your body is exposed to it, what it helps uh, the body do is create a protein called POMC. So here's a nine syllable word for you. It's propiomelanocortin. And when POMC is created, it helps create certain neurotransmitters and other stuff. Here are some of the things it helps. And this is really this cool. Dopamine beta endorphins, serotonin, ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropic releasing hormone that converts to cortisol. And then you have MSH, which is going to be that melanocyte stimulating hormone, which again is how you tan, right? Melanin, melanocyte. And so I'm not saying going to a tanning bed per se, although I do think 
well, I won't say that on the show. I'll just say I think there's a time and place if you live in winter, uh, or sorry, you live in a place that has winter and you're taking care of every other aspect of your health. I think it can be kind of useful. But let's just say for the lay person, <clears throat> I make the case, I think, we're UVA deficient. And the reason I make that case is because I think we need it as an essential part of happiness and feeling good. And we never get exposed to it. And people say, well, no, that's not true. Ev, I go out in the sun. Mm, okay. <laughs> First of all, we spend 93% of our time indoors. So uh, maybe you're one of that 7% or sorry, you're one of those people that spends most of their time uh, indoors. You're probably not. The statistics don't back that up. But here's the other issue. Anytime you are wearing sunglasses, anytime you're wearing prescription glasses, anytime you're wearing contacts, anytime you're in a car with the windows up, anytime you're in a house with the windows up like I am right now, we filter UV light. And you say, well, why would we do something so stupid? Whoever came up with that? Well, the problem is if you get too much UVB, which creates uh, vitamin D, that is the part that could burn you. And I, it's so funny. It's like such simple stuff in a sense, but I think our brains don't wrap around, or maybe mine just doesn't and I'm projecting. Our brains don't wrap around. How, how can this be true? How can this be possible? Okay, do me a favor. Go sit, if you're a Caucasian person, go sit behind a glass window in the middle of summer and tell me how long it takes you to get burned. And I'll give you a little hint so you don't waste your time. You will never get burned. It filters UV light. Just because the light looks the same does not mean that there aren't parts that are filtered. Some light or most light actually um, is invisible to the naked human eye. So when we filtered UVB, we say, I'll just screw it. Filter everything. So we filter all UV light in all of our things. And the problem with that is I think it's making us UVA deficient. And so uh, a solution to this, because UVA is available anytime that the sun's out, obviously it's stronger at certain times. That's why you can't tan in winter, really. You don't see many people getting tanner in winter. You see us getting paler. Uh, but nonetheless, that UVA is present. Take the damn glasses off outside if possible. I wear glasses, but take them off outside if possible. Get that naked eye exposed. Uh, you might actually find that your eye health gets a lot better too, which is really cool. But we got to make sure that we're getting outside, not just because it sounds like a good thing or it intuitively makes sense, but scientifically speaking, outside does so much stuff for us that we we shouldn't even have to talk about this, right? Like you mentioned earlier, there's just some common sense health stuff. Like we don't have to get too expensive with it. Um, so if you didn't follow anything I just said, bottom line, go outside. That That's really <laughs> what we have to do. But that's that's one tip I definitely wanted to leave today because I don't think anyone, um, I don't think it gets shared enough. It definitely, definitely does not. I am um, pretty anti-sunscreen unless I'm going to be at the lake all day. And I also love, like I have a dog, so I have a really great excuse to go outside and get morning sunlight. And I do take my glasses off because they do filter UV lights and they filter blue light since I look at computers all day, sure, sure. you know, so I go outside, I take them off. And in the morning, you don't have to worry about burning. You don't have to worry about your skin getting wrinkled, all these things that they tell you the sun does. But I love that you addressed how it affects neurotransmitters because that's out there, but it is not widely shared, even in the middle of summer. You know, when people are like, hey, get outside, don't wear sunscreen, sunscreen's toxic, blah, blah, blah. But they don't talk about the very real benefits of UV exposure because it's almost taboo. Like, yeah, yeah it's good for you, but it'll wrinkle your skin. And I'm like, you know, I think seed oils and sugar are wrinkling your skin way more than the sunlight will. And if you guys don't believe me, go do some research. The studies are there. I would love to have you back because this is such a deep topic. And I would love to take people deeper. Also, I know you have a podcast and I also know you have a business. So how can people find you? Thanks. And I'm happy to come back anytime. I know the story can be a lot, but sometimes it's fun to just dive into the science stuff. So we can certainly do that anytime. Um, in terms of finding me, the podcast, I actually somehow end up hosting this now for that same company that I got certified with and that changed my life. So functional diagnostic nutrition, and it's called the health detective podcast. And I always say uh, podcast should be like well, hopefully you're not watching TV, but it should be like TV shows. It's not that you choose just one. I mean, you have several that you listen to, right? So I don't want anyone to come to ours and stop listening to this or vice versa. It's like, listen to a variety, get different information. You're going to disagree with some things. You're going to agree with others. That's okay. That's that's what we should have in this space. So um, our podcast is very much story-based. So it would have been very similar to today where you really are diving into the story first and then we're getting into some tips. Um, so we have like 280 episodes. It's a very long TV show. Uh, cool over there. 
So fdntraining.com, I actually think we have, let me double check here, fdntraining.com slash living whole uh, will be the link for this podcast. And you can learn more about our curriculum. It's really for people who want to go do this as work. So if you're inspired to do it as work, uh, definitely come talk to us there. We'd love to have you. And then if you're interested in my business personally, where we do take clients um, full transparency, it's mostly my fiance. She's an FDN as well. So she'll probably be the one working with you, but I usually talk to people on the phone first. Uh, we have Bucks County lighttherapy.com. So that's B-U-C-K-S, Bucks County Light Therapy.com. Um, we do red light therapy. We do a bunch of cool biohacky stuff, but our main product is actually doing uh, lab consultations and we do that worldwide. So it's not just locally, but um, thank you for the opportunity to share my stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. If you found this episode helpful, would you do me a favor and help others find it by leaving a review, sharing a screenshot on social media, or sharing the link with a friend? By you sharing what you've learned, others are able to find this podcast and join our community. Be sure to check out my website, www.roadtolivingwhole.com for over 160 delicious recipes a variety of meal plans, and a blog packed full of even more healthy living tips. If you'd like to learn more about how to work with me as your coach, you can schedule a free consult through www.roadtolivingwhole.com backslash health-coaching backslash. Until next time, friend. Bye.